Okay, welcome to the video for the last lab in Math, uh, math 5301 Probability and Statistics. In this lab, we're going to look compare how the z-test and the t-test, two different types of hypothesis tests, work. And specifically what, they're, what the difference is between them and why, uh, when you're estimating the standard deviation, that the t-test performs better. So what I have here is a bunch of random numbers in your lower right part of the spreadsheet. And for each row, I have 20 random numbers between 0 and 1. Excel calculates those according to the equals rand function. And then there's a 1,000 rows. And then over here on the left, I have x bar. That's just the average of those 20 numbers for that row. And then I have s, which is the sample standard deviation. We get that by typing equals stdev and then putting the range of the data in that trial. Once we have done that, what I do is for that particular trial, I compute a p-value according to a z-test and then according to a t-test. And what you'll notice is that when x-bar is really far from 0.5, like this, this third trial here, wow, x-bar was 0.31. That's a long ways from 0.5. These p-values are really low. Okay. And in particular, in a hypothesis test, if the p-value is less than the level of significance, then that's when we support the alternative hypothesis. We support that there's a difference between the mean output of what we're measuring and the specified value. In this case, the specified value is 0.5. So, what I do here is I count. For the z-tests, how many of these thousand trials give me a p-value less than 0.05. And then for the t-test, I count the same thing. And what we will see is that a t-test tends to perform better. Now, what do I mean by performing better? What I mean by performing better is performing as intended. Remember that alpha, the level of significance, is the probability of a type 1 error. That's the probability that if the null hypothesis is true, we still reject the null hypothesis and support the alternative hypothesis. Unfortunately, that probability has to be positive or else we're never going to be able to detect any difference at all. Okay. Here, I'm pretty confident that the null hypothesis is true. Um, I think if Excel's number generator really gave us a result that was significantly different than one half on average, I think they would have fixed it by now. Okay, So I'm pretty confident it's true. So I really should have that about 5% of my tests actually end up rejecting the null hypothesis. Well here we see with the z-test it's um, 64 and with the t-test it's 47. Five percent of a thousand is 50, so 50 is what we would expect to see. And as I redo this test, I want you to compare these numbers. The, how many of the thousand z-tests rejected the null hypothesis and how many of the thousand t-tests? Sometimes this top number, the number z-test, will be closer to 50. Usually, however, the t-test is closer to 50. Furthermore, it's extremely rare that the z-test number drops below 50. Um, and what that means is that the level of significance for the z-test, even though we set it to be alpha equals 0.05, it's actually a little bit higher. Because on average, it's going to give you somewhere between, it's probably around 6% rather than 5%. Uh, of the time that the null hypothesis is rejected. And the reason for that is is that we're estimating the sample standard deviation. And since we have a relatively small sample size here, 20, that estimate does have some variability in it, which you can certainly see. You see that these estimates are definitely different. Okay, so I want to enter in a bunch of zeros here so that Excel will recalculate everything. Okay, so what I saw there, and what I think you saw as well, is that usually the t-test gave close to f fairly close to 50 of the outputs where the um, alternative hypothesis was supported, whereas the z-test tended to be above 50 most of the time, and most of the time it was further from 50 than the t-test. Not always, however. Sometimes the z-test did end up with 50, and in general we see that the results varied a lot. So I'm going to delete all these numbers, and I guess you'll get to see even more recalculatings. 
And that's what that's, this spreadsheet is showing, is that the t-test tends to perform better because uh, the, this estimation of the standard deviation is accounted for in the t-distribution that's used. Okay, last thing I'm going to do is show you how to... Um, show you how to do these formulas to compute the p-values for the z-test and the t-test. Okay, so first, here's a formula that computes a p-value for a z-test. And what I do here is I take 2 times 1 minus, and then I have this norm dist function. Let me explain what I'm doing. I'm going to pull up my pen pad here so I can write on the screen. X bar, okay, is approximately normal with, let's see, it has a mean under the null hypothesis of 0.5 and a standard deviation of sigma, um, whatever that was for normal distribution, or for a uniform distribution, I think it was b minus a divided by the square root of 12. Um, the square root of b minus a divided by the square root of 12 or something of that sort. But anyway, I divide by the square root of n, which in this case I'm using 20 trials for each case. Now I actually, this is just 20 here. I count how many cells are in that range. Okay. Now, I'm not actually going to look at that normal distribution. What I'm going to do is look at the normal distribution of the difference between my sample mean and 0.5. And that's going to be, all it does is shifts my normal distribution over. I subtract 0.5 from the mean, and then the standard deviation is still the same. Okay. So, this norm dist, what this is, it's sort of like what you get out of the normal distribution table except we haven't standardized it. In other words, we haven't really gotten the z-score by dividing by the standard deviation. Instead, we just take the actual value. What was x bar minus 0.5? Well, for the sixth row, that was cell A6 minus 0.5. And then I'm going to look up the absolute value of that difference, and we'll talk about why in a second. So that's what this is. This right here is just what x value are you um, are you plugging in? Are you observing for your normal distribution? And then it asks you for the mean of the normal distribution, right? That's zero. And then the standard deviation of the normal distribution, that's the sigma, which we're estimating by the sample standard deviation, uh, which is in B6, divided by the square root of 20. And then this true, all that tells us is that you want a cumulative distribution. If you were to put false there, what it would do is give you the value for the PDF, which um, is not useful for this in this particular situation. Okay, you don't need to know that term. We, that's a term that's commonly used in statistics, but in order to get through both probability and statistics in one semester, we didn't we didn't formally study cumulative distributions, even though you're using them for the normal distribution. Okay, so this is like a normal distribution table in that okay, my mean is zero. When I take this absolute value, I'm going to get a non-negative number. It gives me this area. It gives me this area. Now we know that for the p-values, we want to find the probability that the sample be mean would be more extreme than what we saw. So it would be this area. Okay? So what we want to do, let me erase what I just did there. What we want to do is make sure that we take the absolute value of that difference so that I get a positive result. And then, once I know that I've got a positive result, something that's bigger than zero, then I know that this green area, just one of the two little tails here, is 1 minus A, where A is the red area. And then to get the other tail, to get this part on the other side, okay, I just added on another one of those. In other words, I multiply by 2. So I have 2 times 1 minus, and then this whole norm dist function is what's given me that area, like what you're used to getting on the normal distribution table. Now notice it's different because I didn't compute a z-score. In particular, I didn't take this observed value and divide by the standard deviation, but instead I just told Excel that that's what the standard deviation of my normal distribution is. Okay, now let's go on to the um, p-value for the t-test. Okay, for the p-value for the t-test, 
let's see, I'll click on this. It's a little bit simpler because Excel knows uh, if you're using a T distribution, you're probably doing a hypothesis test. So it goes ahead and it computes those two tails for you. Um, so let's see, let me try to point out what I'm doing here. Again, I'm using the absolute value of the X bar, the sample mean, minus 0.5. But notice I'm going ahead and I'm dividing by that standard deviation. So this is this is actually a T-score, which is looks the same as a Z-score, but we use it for a different purpose. So I go ahead and I take that absolute difference and divide by the standard deviation. Okay, and then my second, that's my first input. The second input is the degrees of freedom. And remember that the degrees of freedom is n minus 1. So n is how many numbers are in that range, and then we subtract 1. So I count how many numbers are in that range, and then I subtract 1. And then this 2 simply tells it that I want to do a two-tailed test, and not a one-tailed test. Okay, so that's it. That's how um, you want to set up the formulas. And uh, this is it. This is the last lab. So let me know if you have any questions and good luck.